At this time, I'd like to read uh, the, uh, the bio for Father James Krasinski. I met Father Krasinski in 2015 at the same Vatican Observatory Foundation workshop in Tucson that I attended, and I found out at that time that he was the inspiration behind the, uh, that workshop. Father James Krasinski has a license in sacred theology. He was ordained on June 29th, 28th, the feast of Saint Irenaeus. Saint Irenaeus. Saint Irenaeus. Okay. And in 2003, he was named pastor of St. Olaf Parish in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, the Diocese of La Crosse. He serves as Dean of the Eau Claire? Eau Claire. Okay. Not Eau Claire. Eau Claire. <laughs> Uh, Catholic deanery. Uh, Father Krasinski is also a hobbyist, uh, a hobby astronomer, originally from a small town in Am of Amherst in central Wisconsin. He attended the University of St. Mary of the Lake, a Mundelein, that's the, uh, the Chicago Archdiocese, and, um, and has completed the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. In regard to his interest in astronomy, Father Krasinski is a member of both the Chippewa Valley Astronomy Astronomical Society and the La Crosse Area Astronomical Society. He taught an introductory uh, to astronomy course during his time as Regis High School in Eau Claire. His first involvement with the Vatican Observatory came when an inquiry led to the development of the first, quote, faith and astronomy workshop. <coughs> And he'll explain that, and it was designed at that time for parish educators, clergy, that are not professional scientists. So at this time, let us welcome Father James Krasinski. I got a hoot. <laughs> I didn't even have to do one of the, oh, no, 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 yes. <laughs> Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, you teach us that the, he the heavens declare your glory. As we come here today to hope and pray for clear skies tomorrow, Lord, please. <laughs> Let us also remember, too, that we not only come here for an astronomical event, but we come here to encounter you in word and sacrament and in this wonderful community of faith. Thank you for all the insights that you have given to our group, the insights that are to come. And on this weekend of the second week of Easter, of which we celebrate today as divine mercy, we ask that your mercy reign our world, not vengeance, not violence. We ask that your mercy truly spread throughout the world and allow both your sacred heart, uh, or your son's sacred heart, and the Immaculate Heart of Mary to inspire us to have a heart for one another and a heart for our world. We ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Just as uh, Father asked me to just explain a little bit about what the Faith and Astronomy Workshop is, it actually no longer is called that. It's now ACME. Not ACME, ACME. <laughs> Astronomy for Catholics in Ministry and Education. And the main reason why there was a need for some rebranding, because I think that a lot of times, again, within some of the polemical natures of our culture, a lot of people came thinking that what they were going to experience was some type of, here's a faith question, here's a science question, here's how you fight, here's how you resolve. And that's not what the workshop is. Um, the workshop is more of uh, the professional Jesuits, scientists at the Vatican Observatory, throwing the people into professional science. It's not a spoon-feeding experience. You bring you to those experiences, so you bring your faith. Um, and then we come to discover what the true bridge between faith and science is. Uh, the true bridge isn't a series of intellectual principles, it's not a set of well-established laws, whether those be natural or supernatural. You are the bridge between faith and science. Faith and science are 
not dualistic quasi-deities that are in constant battle with each other. Faith and science are things we do as people. Um, and even in very simple ways. Uh, I won't go too far into this because this isn't an ACME workshop, but I deal with science every day as a pastor. How many more days will these candles burn before I have to buy new ones? <laughs> I need a wax study, a wax to flame study on this. <laughs> the boiler is out again. <laughs> what went wrong? <laughs> I live in the world of science <laughs> on a daily basis. Um, and I think that if we think of science less as this quasi deity that sometimes it can falsely be betrayed at, and as a way that we understand and away from that understanding the way we do, similar to faith as this is how I encounter God, how that informs me and in light of that encounter, this is what I do, we can develop a much more healthy entry point into uh, these questions. So, shameless plug, it's an off year coming up this January, correct? Um, and so it's an every other year event. Um, originally, we, it was heavy clergy focused, but now we accept it's an ecumenical group. We take clergy, laity, men, women, uh, Christians. Uh, I don't know if we've had a non-Christian come well, yet. Well, certainly among the instructors we have. In the instructors we have. And it really is kind of a, um, just throw you into the world of professional science, then you bring your faith uh, to that. And if you, Understand that going in, boy, this last group we had was spectacular. <laughs> um, they got it right away. It can be a powerful experience. So, shameless plug. Couple housekeeping. Now I feel like I'm back at a high school too. Housekeeping before we get to the lecture. Who got a detention? No. <laughs> um, so just some uh, follow up from yesterday. There were some good questions that came up I wanted to just briefly address. A couple of you mentioned, Father, could you really remember the name of that documentary that you mentioned with Rabbi Sachs on BBC? Um, and so I just, again, all I did was literally, here's a search, Rabbi Sachs, BBC, Dawkins, and it was one of the things. It is called Science Versus Religion. Non-inflammatory title at all, is that? <laughs> but believe me, by the end of it, I'm now starting to see why Rabbi Sachs did this, because to the point of you know, the comment of the expelled. This is to me expelled what it, the way it should have been done versus the way that it was. And so just as a tease, here's the beginning of it. In an age of unprecedented scientific progress. Oops, wrong way. Every aspect of our lives is shaped by the latest discoveries and innovations. <laughs> For me, science is one of the greatest achievements of humankind. A gift given to us by God. But there are many who see me as misguided. They say my religious faith has become invalid. It's an outdated way of thinking that doesn't fit in a scientific world of hard evidence and binary logic. about training children to believe things for which there's no evidence. Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is when we commemorate the creation of the universe and its God-given wonders. Okay, well... Oh! <laughs> That's an advertisement, by the way. Let it sit for about 30 minutes. I'll skip that because I don't have toilet issues. It's <laughs> to change the assumption that science and religion cannot coexist. I'm about to meet three non-believing scientists, each working at the frontier of scientific discovery. A neurologist, a theoretical physicist, and the evolutionary biologist who leads the scientific war on religion. My mission is not to convert. That's not the nature of my faith. What I hope to show is that belief in God doesn't require a suspension of our critical faculties, 
and that together religion and science can make a great partnership. There's your cheese. <laughs> um, highly recommended. It was, um, secondly, just as some of you were like, Father, you're doing photography. If you want to see some photography, go to Flickr, social media for photography. Um, I got all of my um, albums up there. As you can see, I do a lot of different kinds of photography. Um, my two fox pups that I found one day were some of my favorite images that I got. And I also, as you can, without surprise, I also have on here Oh, Arizona highlights, if you want to see visuals of where the ACME conferences go, you can go to Our Lady of the Desert album or my Arizona highlights. And of course, I've got my little astro astrophotography, um, you know, my little uh, catalog of shots of just all kind of different things I've photographed over the years. For obvious reasons, I like getting shots of the Milky Way with churches. I wonder why. Um, <laughs> um, just kind of some deep space stuff. But anyway, just a lot of fun stuff. So I know that some of you, when you saw me with my camera last night, um, you were wondering, Father, can we see some of your photography? Flickr, look up my name. You can, you can stalk me all day long. So. Um, Next, and then I promise I'll get to my presentation. <coughs> Incidentally, Father, uh, how long do I have? Is it? Uh, I'm a gabber. Um, mass is at 11, so at least at 10.30. Okay, so yeah. e easily get you out of here by then. Um, so there was a question afterward, wondering, Father, could you find that quote on um, evolution that Bank the 16th gave to the retreat? two Germans, and this is it. Um, this came uh, July 24th, 2007, Re response to question six. Basically, he was at a retreat of German clergy and was doing a Q&A. &A. And the, the question was kind of more of like, concern about youth, very similar to the question that we had yesterday. How do we keep our young people from drifting? And back to 16's answer, currently I see in Germany, but also in the United States, a somewhat fierce debate raging between so-called creationism and evolutionism, presented as though they were mutually exclusive alternatives. Those who believe in the creator would not be able to conceive of evolution, and those who instead support evolution would have to exclude God. This antithesis is absurd, because on the one hand, there are so many scientific proofs in favor of evolution, which appears uh, to be a reality we can see and which enriches our knowledge of life and being as such. Um, so for those of you who are kind of curious, and I don't blame you one bit if you're like, okay, Father, you said Bannock said that. I want to get it. There it is. So, and if you want to look that up, the Q&A is fascinating. It's not all about faith and science. I mean, he covers, as Benedict always did. A Q&A with Benedict was like a three-week seminar um, of beautiful, beautiful stuff. That's one thing that sometimes, you know, like when I write, I write a lot for care for, I'm prayer for creation. And so people are like, oh, you must be a Pope Francis guy. Don't get me wrong, I'm cool with Francis, but I actually, the one, the guy who got me into care for creation was Benedict. Um, there's a reason why he was nicknamed the Green Pope um, in his time in his papacy. And I, I don't see Francis as this, uh, and I don't want this to sound disrespectful of Francis, I don't see Francis as like this new wave of Catholic ecology. It's, I see Francis more of just a logical continuation of what had been set before him by previous popes and within medieval theology, which is a whole different talk that I'll give some other day if you'd like me to come back. So, so my talk for today, Catholic and Gay, oh, and I, I'll get the other stuff too, on, specifically on the documentary. I, I poked around last night, it's gonna take me a little time, but I'll get that to the group somehow. Um, faith and Science Retreat, Catholic Engagement with the Natural World. So, since it seems like every talk has talked about a book you can buy for 19.95 on Amazon, <laughs> Here's a book you can't buy because it doesn't exist yet. Um, I am working on a book. Belongs 
uh, story short, somebody from our Sunday visitor contacted uh, the Vatican Observatory and uh, Rebecca Martin. Um, I know that Rebecca Martin is known to the staff here, uh, but uh, talk about a delightful young woman to work with. Um, graduate of um, Christendom College and uh, she said, we've been stalking you. <laughs> they didn't say that, but essentially that's what they were saying. And we want a book on faith and science. And we were wondering if either Brother Guy or myself would be interested. And, you know, Brother Guy, kind of busy. <laughs> so, um, but I asked with Rebecca, talked with Rebecca, and she said, yeah, we were actually hoping that, um, you know, if Brother Guy couldn't, we were really hoping you could write the book because... I read your series on an ode to an intellectual father, which is um, a series I did for the Sacred Space Astronomy blog on my thoughts of Bank the 16th, which ironically the last post went live the day he died, which was both meaningful to me as somebody who in seminary, you know, it was like, <laughs> Every other theologian probably encompassed that much of our reading lists, and Benedict, when I was just saying, I mean, Ratzinger, I mean, if, if you didn't have a Ratzinger book on your reading list when I was in seminary, something was wrong with the class. I mean, it just, every class had Ratzinger on the reading list. And uh, I said, well, there's a problem, though. I already wrote a book on faith and science, and to be quite frank, being that I'm a priest and a dean, and I have a whole lot of other hats. I don't have much time to write a book. So if you just want me to rewrite the book I wrote before, the answer is no, because I just, I, not that I, my book is the definitive, no, it's just, I, I don't have new insights. I don't really feel like I have a logical follow-up. And they said, no, 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 Father, we don't want you to write that book. And I found, and I'm not trying to impress you that I'm writing a book for our Sunday visitor, but the reasons why they want me to write the book are what I bring to you. Of course, they think about it both from a very devout Catholic, our Sunday visitor is a very devoutly Catholic publishing company, but also obviously from a business standpoint. And Rebecca said very clearly, sales of books on apologetics are plummeting. Um, people just are not interested in buying books on apologetics anymore. That's not what their readership is looking for. Why that is, I don't know. <laughs> you know. But what is on the rise, on the uptick in the business side of religious books is books looking for the beauty of faith are on the rise. Books that are more of authentic Catholic spiritual meditative texts are what's being, um, being uh, there's a thirst for. And, and that kind of fits my experience of a high school chaplain and a college chaplain. I was the generation as a Gen X Catholic. <laughs> Does it make sense? For me, it was less about does the priest like me or not, or does this parish like me or not. Th those, when I was in, those weren't the questions. It's like, okay, tell, give me a good reason to believe this, and if you give me a reasonable answer to why I should believe in God, that was good enough for me. Apologetics, reasonable defenses for the faith. And I found very quickly in high school and college ministry that's not where youth are at right now. <laughs> They're asking more fundamental questions. Do I matter to you? Do I matter to the church? Will you be there for me when I'm scared? Um, and they never stated it this well. And please do not take this personally if you have college age kids or, I know how to meet my parents' expectations. You know, I know how to meet their expectations about grades, and, but am I loved? You know, those are questions that ministerially are emerging. So 
part of me thinks that that just raw ministerial experience I have might be playing into why young people are not looking for what I looked for, which was give me good, solid, why should I believe, and when I go into a battle with somebody that doesn't agree with me, here's what I say. They're not looking for that. They want their human dignity honored, first and foremost. Then after you do that, when you establish that, then by all means, then they are tremendously open to reasonable arguments about faith and apologetics. It's not, and to use the great Catholic intuition, it's not an either or, it's a both and um, in this realm. So Rebecca said, what we want you to do is write a, a series it's going to be a whole series of books. So Rebecca, if you're watching online, I'm sorry if I'm spoiling our Sunday visitors game plan, but they're coming out with a whole series of books on how can we re-engage Catholics in the natural world in a way that, and what's so cute, how she, you know, Father, in a way that, well, you know, kind of, and I just said to her, in a way that we're not ending up worshiping Gaia. <laughs> and she's like, yes, that's what we're looking for. That's something that's authentically Catholic. And I'm like, I'll write your book. And so I've been working on it. Proposal approved, I'm on chapter three. Um, and when Rebecca mentioned what's happening in the market of faithful Catholic authorship, it hit with me with something, to be quite frank, that goes right back to seminary. Relational faith versus rational faith. How do we relate to God and beauty? How do we relate to each other as a beautiful expression of God's love? How can we relate to the created world we live in to see the fingerprints of God? Relational questions. And then for me, being that, as I said, something that I care very much about is care for creation. You know, obviously with Laudato Si, Pope Francis. When we speak of the environment, what we really mean is a relationship existing between nature and the society which lives in it. Nature cannot be regarded as something separate from ourselves or as a mere setting in which we live. We are a part of nature, included in it, and thus is con in constant interaction with it. And then further from what I would consider one of my intellectual fathers, Bank the Sixteenth, the church has a responsibility toward creation, and she considers it her duty to exercise that responsibility in public life in order to protect earth, water, and air as gifts of God, the Creator, meant for everyone, and above all, to save mankind from the danger of, of self-destruction. The degradation of nature is closely linked to the cultural models shaping human coexistence. Consequently, when human ecology is respected within society, environmental ecology also benefits. If you want to cultivate peace, says Pope Benedict, protect creation. The quest for peace by people of goodwill surely would become easier if I'll acknowledge the indivisible relationship between God, human beings, and the whole of creation. In the light of divine revelation and infidelity to the church's tradition, Christians have their own contribution to make. They contemplate the cosmos. Why did you come here? Um, <laughs> And it's marvels. In light of, creative, uh, of the creative work of the Father and the redemptive work of Christ, who by his death and resurrection has reconciled with God all things, whether on earth or in heaven. Um, that quote's going to be in the foreword. <laughs> Just tease. <laughs> but... The point being is that I think Rebecca and Catholic um, and our study of Israel is spot on. And it really shows us what I think would be the great ongoing battle in Vatican II 
For those of you who are theologians, I'm going to speak in great general, 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 general it's not going to be an in-depth dive, <laughs> just because I, um, I know I'm just going to be superficial, so totally feel free to tear it apart over coffee. So what's the general tension with Vatican II? Rauner and Balthazar, seen as two of the great intellectual spearheads of Vatican II. Both Jesuits, incidentally. Yes, another shout out to the team. Um, <laughs> and what we can see is the core distinction between Rauner and Balthazar is Rauner saw in his theological process an ascent to truth from reason to beauty. More of what I would call a Thomist approach based on the Summa, meaning, you know, you have a question, you have a debate, you come to a deeper truth, and then as you develop a philosophy of religion through that question and dialogue, you then, once you come to this intellectual understanding of God, then there's an ascent into divine beauty. Balthazar starts with beauty and works back with reason. More of an Augustinian, more mystical approach. Throw yourself into beauty, says Balthazar. Once encountering beauty, we long to understand the truth behind beauty. And that is the tension between the two. Do you start with truth to beauty or beauty to truth? Now, as is the case these days when I was in seminary, the professors never forced us to take sides, but we as normal seminarians definitely did. <laughs> And you had the Renarians and the Balthasarians and the duel to the death. I was a, I didn't go to college seminary. I was a central Wisconsin farm kid. So first I didn't take a side because I was terrified. I'm like, I'm just trying to understand this. And I've got a dictionary here, a dictionary there, and trying to figure out half the words of the Summa that don't translate well. But as I understood them more, I still haven't taken sides. <laughs> The reason being is that there's things that I like of Rauner, and there's things I like of Balthazar, and there's things I don't like of Rauner, and there's things I don't like of Balthazar. Get, let me explain what, why. Um, who is right and who is wrong? The Jesuit death match <laughs> between Rauner and Balthazar. I love art. I'm a creative. If I was born this day, not to shock you all, I might have a man bun. I don't have enough hair for a man bun. Um, <laughs> But this, one of my favorite artists is Van Gogh. And this, I would say that to the populace, is arguably one of the most identifiable. Once you see it, oh yeah, that's Van Gogh. And at, incidentally, Brenda Fry, I don't know, years ago, did a beautiful little summary for the blog on the science of this, which I'm not going to speak to it, ask her about it, because it's her writing, and she can explain it much better than I can. And I love this image, too, as a Van Gogh fan. I have a huge print of it over my couch in the living room. Um, it's a beautiful painting. But here's the problem. Okay, Balthazar, beauty. Wow, look at that. You got a church there. You got the I mean, you got Fibonacci sequences going on in the, in the sky and all that kind of stuff. And um, you talk with art historians, this is not the piece they think best represents Van Gogh. Most art historians who know his backwaters, um, I'm sorry, here's another. <laughs> if the small version wasn't enough, here's the big version. <laughs> they would say this version does. The Church of Auvers. Now, when you look at this picture in comparison with that, more pretty. <laughs> that's, what, that's what my brain says. But why... Does the Church of Auver, do art critics say, better represents Van Gogh? Because when you look at it, when you look at an actual photograph of the church, the proportions are just, it's like he, I can almost see Van Gogh just setting up an easel and okay, there it is, and painting away. One of the things we forget about Van Gogh, the majority of his life he wasn't an artist. Van Gogh had a deep desire as a devout Catholic to become a priest and he was rejected and never allowed to pursue priesthood. And the reason he painted the church of Over the way he did 
is that he found the perspective of the church where no doors are present. The person here is walking away with a downcast look. This was his inner expression of his frustration of never being allowed to be a priest. He painted the face of the church scraggly, more so than he typically scraggly does, <laughs> with almost this aggressive ugliness, dare I say gothicness in the original sense of gothic. You know, now we're like, oh, Gothic Cathedral is beautiful. It was originally meant to be a derogatory statement of, that's ugly, that's gothic, you know. Um, and this expresses his heart. Now, when I found that out, um, before I sat on the seminary admissions board, or the diocese admissions board, my first thought was, poor guy. But then when I started to read psychological evaluations of young men who are considering entering the priesthood, there might have been something in Van Gogh's psychological profile that gave the admissions board a moment of pause. <laughs> um, so before we, we turn Van Gogh into yet another great you know, victim of the Catholic Church, I had a cancer lesion taken off my ear. First time I've ever been diagnosed with a little thing of skin cancer. That was horrible. <laughs> um, I think it's safe to say that along with Van Gogh's genius, there were also deep inner struggles. And maybe the reason he wasn't allowed to be a priest isn't a mean, nasty Catholic church, but maybe it was pretty evident that your gifts are best served elsewhere. But as many who I know who have not been allowed to study, the pain can still exist. <laughs> the pain can still remain. Wanting to pursue something that others can, and you can't. Um, so for me, both as our Rahner, do, do I think that Rahner has a point? Absolutely. If you don't know the backwaters of this painting, it might just look like a weird church. <laughs> um, but once you know the backwaters, this would be a Rahner argument. But there's a problem with the Rahner argument. Let's say that you, all right, here in Bloomington, there's going to be this great traveling exhibit of Van Gogh paintings. Okay, what's the Rahner approach? Study everything you can about Rahner, his, you know, his growing up, his religious experience. Study every painting, understand all the, everything. And then when you finally finish studying everything you can about Van Gogh, oh, it left already. <laughs> Just moved right through the town. <laughs> you learned all this great stuff about Van Gogh, but you never experienced Van Gogh. <laughs> you know about Van Gogh which I think is the trap in, of Rahner. We can get so deep into our philosophy of a God that we never allow ourselves an authentic experience of the beauty of God. Just as with Balthazar, wow, Jesus, hi! <laughs> I went out this retreat in my life, boom! Just everything's exploding, I'm seeing everything new, I'm receptive to faith in a brand new way. Beauty of faith, and then two weeks later, the bubble bursts. And you go through the pain that many do on a powerful retreat. Oh, my eyes have changed, but nobody I live with's eyes have. They all see things the same. And now what was deep grace has become a desert and a pain. And we can, well, then I'll just go and find another Jesus high. <laughs> And we turn religion into nothing but not asceticism, you know, the rattle, but aestheticism <laughs> of just constantly looking for, well, beauty, then 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 beauty. Well, why? Why was that a powerful retreat experience? 
do you have to develop a little bit of a philosophy of your faith now in light of this to help develop a firm foundation with this? I see this tension too in young Catholics. Um, I know that there's um, always the big debate about, you know, traditional liturgy versus modern liturgy, all that kind of stuff, and young people are gravitating more towards traditional liturgy and those type of things. And for me, to be quite frank, as somebody that loves both, I never understand the fight. <laughs> you know, I just, I, uh, God has spoken to me in, in Tridentine Latin masses, God's spoken to me in more modern contemporary uh, masses. Um, there was a time when I was in college that I fell in love with a liturgical dancer before I was a priest. That's a whole other story that <laughs> doesn't need to. <laughs> Let's just say that wasn't an authentic experience of God. <laughs> um, um, well, leave the rest for the memory of God's mercy to me in confession. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but the point being is that when I talk with young people, whether they like traditional liturgy or not, whether they like progressive liturgy or not, why do they gravitate to those type of things? There's something sensible about that. Father, I like smelling incense. It turns something in my senses on spiritually when I smell incense. I love the sounds. There's something about the beauty that draws me into it. Great! But a lot of times those same kids would say, and I have no idea about faith. <laughs> you know, sometimes people say, Father, do you see a distinction between your work with high school kids and your work with college kids? Other than the obvious age differences, developmental differences, all that kind of stuff. When I taught at a high, Catholic high school, I can definitively say, not just because I was one of their teachers, those kids had a very good grounded understanding of Ronner style, you know, the, the principles of their faith. A lot of it didn't get here. <laughs> there was a divorce somehow, some way. My college kids at a state university who predominantly were public school kids, boy, I had a group of kids that would lie in front of a bus for the Catholic Church, but they didn't have a clue why. <laughs> they didn't have a clue why they should. And so therefore, in a real way, my ministry has been this Ron or Balthazar tension. And again, for me, great Catholic both and, less filling, tastes great, let's have both. <laughs> um, um, a both and, are there things that we can affirm from both these great thinkers that are true? But as with all great thinkers, acknowledging that both of them were human and are flawed, eh, there's some things we should let go of too. Now, how does this relate with engaging with the natural world? A lot of it does. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I just had to, I'm so proud of our little Lily. As a parish priest, you have these moments with your little kiddos that just kind of, oh, I just threw this in here. For our fun fest every year, Jesus had fun fests, by the way. I'm sure that he did. He got his 12 again. You know, okay, we need to take a break from our missionary journeys, and we need to have a fun fest. We need to have a pulled pork dinner and all that. But, um, it's a joke. It's, it's, a, it's a joke. Um, but we have a truck drawing contest to, for the kids. And Lily, one of our kiddos, she's one of those kids in the parish that is just... She don't care what you think. She just loves you, every one of you. I can guarantee you if our little 12-year-old Lily was here, every one of you would have gotten a hug from her at least five times. I mean, she's just that kind of a kid. Um, her first, her favorite words are, Father, can I do something at Mass today? <laughs> I mean, she just loves her faith. And, and I just, I thought when, when Lily chalk drew, this is the facade, and actually if you saw the actual picture, it's not too bad of a rendering of St. Olaf Church. I was so consoled because one, it kind of rem reminded me of Van Gogh, <laughs> you know, a little. But what also, um, the doors of her church are open. And there was just something in that depiction that I always hope my dear Lily always see those doors as open. So just as a quick side. All right. So 
when we look at um, creation, and don't worry, this isn't a Fibonacci numbers presentation, because to be quite frank, half of them annoy the living daylights out of me when I hear them. <laughs> Fibonacci is the secret code. The God. It's fascinating, don't get me wrong. You know, it is. But temper things down. Faith, science, not dueling gods. They're, that's what we do. Beauty and math. Rahner and Balthazar. How do we engage the natural world? Hurricanes. Wow. Beautiful, yes. Devastating, can be, absolutely. Terrifying. Spiral galaxies. Wow. Beauty. Sunflowers. I have a whole thing of sunflowers on my Flickr page, by the way. Fascinating. And isn't it odd that things that kind of captivate us and fascinate us have this odd little <laughs> mathematical proportion that can be actually graphed? <laughs> now, does that mean that sunflowers and spiral galaxies are the same? No. <laughs> Doctrine of God. Whenever we use analogy to kind of say, oh, God is like this. There's a greater dissimilarity than a similarity um, to those analogies. But still, it's kind of fun. Why does that shape appear everywhere? <laughs> there would be scientific explorations into that. Maybe there could be faith explorations into that. All I can say from a faith standpoint Awe and wonder, which has been kind of this overarching theme. Wow. Balthazar. It's okay sometimes just to gaze in wonderment at our natural world and go, wow. One of the things that I know this has been met with pretty strong mixed reviews when Pope Francis put forward the potential of two new works of, of mercy that no offense to the Pope, he could have made the, the verbiage on them a lot clearer. They're kind of clunky, but I've summarized them down to corporal work of mercy, care for God's creation, spiritual work of mercy, contemplate God's creation. That would have been so much more simple <laughs> of an explanation. But caring for God's creation, why is that important? Well, if you don't have usable, as Bannock would point out, if you don't have usable resources... Families can't get jobs because you need resources to support an economy. You need an economy for families to support one another. Um, you need economies and families' health care to make sure that we can respect dignity of human life from conception to natural death and every point in, a bit in between. And if you don't have a stable environment, what happens, what happens is Sudan. <laughs> um, what happens is areas where as Benedict XVI, and he's not the only one, others have said this, is frighteningly pre predicted. The future of warfare will not be religious or political. The future of modern warfare will be over water. It will be over things like the Fertile Strip, over access to natural resources to care for people. Um, we have to take care of these things. And when we do, we can wonder at them too. Now we can also look at what's other ways we can wonder in the natural world. I, one thing is, uh, don't forget we can take wonder in each other too. <laughs> you know, don't get me wrong. I found great beauty and wonder, and as all of you have. And you can see it in my pictures of things like flowers and butterflies and that kind of stuff. And I, that stuff stirs my heart too. Let each other stir your hearts as well. <laughs> in a safe environment approved manner. <laughs> um, sorry, just kind of inside Catholic church joke for those who work on stamps. <laughs> um, but um, I wonder at Maximilian Colby. Um, not just because my last name is Krasinski and he's Polish, but um, a man who, when Hitler rose, used his platform, unlike other Catholics at that time, to point out the danger, ended up in a concentration camp because 
he had the boldness to share the truth versus turn the other way. And when there was an escape from the concentration camp and 10 random people were chosen to be executed, a Jewish man pleaded to the Nazis, don't kill me, I have a wife and children. Something that he could have gotten shot, Maximilian Kolbe stepped forward and said, I will take his place. Took the man's place, put into a prison. Um, the other people were, they decided to starve them to death. And what was Kolbe's response? They would sing psalms together in, in the jail. He was the only one left. And to the point where he would not die, so the Nazis had to kill him by lethal injection. On the day of his canonization, the man he stood in the presence for and his wife and his kids were at his canonization in Rome. I wonder at that part of creation. <laughs> I wonder at this man who is not somehow separate from, but a part of this fascinatingly beautiful world. And in amid grave ugliness, was one of my inspirations to become a priest. In our diocese, and I promise we'll keep this to a minimum, there's a lot of our local heroes. Father Solanus Casey grew up in Prescott, um, sadly, again, he was bounced out of seminary because he was deemed not intellectually smart enough to be a priest. Why? He couldn't learn Latin. As someone with dyslexia, I have a gut feeling of why that was an issue for him. Um, but if you read his stories to this day, we were talking about miracles the other day. My goodness, the miracles that have come, both in life and in death. Father Joe Walieski, Smiling Joe, founder of Casa Hogar Juan Pablo Secundo, our orphanage in Lima, Peru. I mean, not Lima, but in Lorin, Peru. Taking nine mission trips down to Lorin um, to visit his orphanage, to meet the kids. Um, a man who basically takes the lost children of Peru, that some of them have literally been thrown into a dumpster. I met a girl down there in Peru that because of the cultural understanding of the time when she was born, her father was angry because he wanted a boy but got a girl, so he literally ripped, the bait, ripped her out of her mother's arms, uh, threw her into a dumpster, and left her there. Um, that's what she learned afterward when Father Joe tried to reconnect her with her biological parents. Unsurprisingly, Mom was okay with getting reconnected. Father Joe would literally take the junk of the streets and care for them. Um, Brother James Miller, assassinated in Honduras for supporting a school that tried to help young people to stay away from, um, away from organized crime of the area. And Sister Adele, if you've ever been to Green Bay, go to Champion, uh, the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Hope. If you ever heard, you know, you hear the Chicago fire, there was also the Peshtigo fire um, as well. Her, the church she was at, she, Marian apparitions, approved by the church, approved by the bishop and by Rome. And it was really cute because the story and, you know, how much of it is true, true, and how much of it is hagiography, I have a gut feeling it's pretty true because literally everything around the church burned. And as the story goes, as Sister Dell, everybody's like, Sister Dell, leave the church, leave the parish. You're going to burn to death. The fire's going to consume everything. Oh, no, I'll stay. <laughs> I can just see this happy little nun. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll stay. <laughs> and a couple of the other sisters stayed with her too. And as the story goes, Sister Adele, the flames are coming to this side of the church. The story goes, she would take her rosary and just kind of happily doo -doo -doo -doo. And the flames kind of stop. Sister Bell, flames are coming over here. <laughs> it sounds comical and almost nutty, but I don't know. There's something to it. When you see it, I'm like, that's plausible. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I, I could see that really being what happened. Um, when we talk about engagement of our natural world, you're a part of that natural world, so be sure 
that you wonder with each other. Our Sunday visitor's goal is to develop a series of books to get people to focus more on the natural world than on the virtual world. So my volume of this is help people love outer space versus cyberspace. The Titanic battle. Um, now, when we look at this, we'll come back to Comet Neowise. That's a picture I took of Comet Neowise over the Chippewa River. My passions, gazing and wondering at God's creation. When I was a kid, ironically, astronomy, science wasn't the reason I fell in love with stargazing. I was a dreamer kid. I'm a creative, I'm an artist. I was the kid that would lie in the backyard and just look for clouds or animals in the clouds all day long. I had this whole metaphysics as a four-year-old where my grandfather, Anthony Riley, died a week before I was born, and I heard all these stories about how wonderful of a man he was. I'm like, gosh, I wish I would have met him. And I'd just be as a four-year-old, I'd lie on the ground, and I'd see a big puffy cloud, and I'm like, that's so pretty. I bet you grandpa's up there, because I bet you heaven's up there. But then as a four-year-old, I, there, there was signs of something going on in the noodle because I'm like, well, what about thunderstorms? And to, well, that must be where the devil is. So when I was a kid, when a storm would come, I would sprint down to the basement like a madman, not because I was as scared of a tornado. I'm like, I don't want to get hit by the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I eventually got on an airplane and learned the truth of, of my, the air of my ways, but... Isn't it beautiful that we have wired within us this natural desire in terms of, as Benedict XVI point, of gazing in wonderment at the cosmos. We want our story to be, quote unquote, up there. And we, all of us, naturally have this desire to have what's up there going on in here, too. It's powerful when you think about it. Constellations. There is evidence that um, Greek constellations and Chinese constellations, that there was some, some type of cross-pollination in the development of those intellectual themes. What about Native American <laughs> constellations? Now, much smarter minds than I in the room might be able to show that there might have been some kind of connections, but I have yet to find any ancient society of consolation development in the ancient world. <laughs> well, as Native Americans, why are you going to be your consolations? Well, where does Pluto fit on this? Is Pluto a planet? No, we just want to, we just want to have the trickster played out in the night sky. We're, we don't care about Pluto, you know, I'm just lonely. Um, why is it that no matter what culture we're talking about, we naturally wanted this to resonate here? Um, another one of my passions, wild my, wild wildlife photography. Um, this is a Sawit owl, by the way, if you are not an owler. I am an owler. I have a group of friends that we know that everybody else thinks we're crazy, but we just... This owl looks huge, right? Find it sleeping. Oh, we got a burner here. You can fit that little thing in the palm of your hand. That's how it's tiny so it all are. I actually help out. There's a citizen <coughs> science program nearby that uh, bans solid owls to track their migrations and that kind of stuff. I tell you what, when you find one of these little suckers in a tree, <laughs> especially sleeping and you're not bothering them and they stay asleep and they don't, they don't give you the, ah, you're going to eat me and fly away, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you want to talk about a time to contemplate the wonderment of God's creation? Sat there for 20 minutes with that little owl. 15 minutes, talk amongst yourselves with the people around you. And then we'll do one of my famous Father James group chats. Are there examples of beauty in your life that bring you closer to God in the natural world? Not your favorite cell phone game. <laughs> I, I love Candy Crush. <laughs> That's what we're trying to get away from. <laughs> Talk with the people around you. And we kind of did this yesterday already a little bit, so it kind of ruins the thunder a little bit. But Talk with the people next to you. 
What are examples of beauty in your life that bring you closer to God? 15 minutes, go. <laughs> Classroom father. <laughs> Taskmaster. <laughs> Coming back in f 10, 9, 8, 7, all systems go, 6, 5, engage thrusters, 4, 3, 2, 1, I need my peeps back. The blue line is for parking. The red line, sorry. <laughs> All right, let's go. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. hand up, yep. Sow it. Sow it. Yeah, you, you sow it, yeah. I forgot. I'm, I lived in Nebraska for a while, so I talk a little southern, but not too much. I somehow thought Redemptorist meant Dymphna, St. Dymphna, by the way. There is a St. Dymphna Center. But, um, but yeah, when I lived in Kearney, Nebraska, if you said something funny, it was a hoot. If you said something really funny, it was a hoot and a holler. But <laughs> so, saw wit owl. Um, cute little guys. And really, when you ban them, just you grab them and eventually they get, give you the eyeball of, you're gonna eat me! And then when you reali they realize you're not gonna eat me, they kind of become like Paddington Bear when you hold them, like, oh, okay, how are you today? <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, like, but, all right, let's start over here. What, who wants to be the representative of what y'all talked about? Uh, a brother guy does. No, no, brother. <laughs> to make sure the team stays happy, the team is pointing at the two of you, so. <laughs> So fish and aquarium, traveling, painting, owls, snorkeling, very good. Oh, go ahead. Jumping into Lake Huron. Jumping into Lake Huron. Brother Guy was part of the National Polar Bear Club Society. When he was <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. July, it would be like the National yeah. <laughs> And more importantly, why did all those things strike you as a beautiful moment bringing you closer to God? Dun, 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 dun. Isn't that true? He said that in all those, and in, in, correct me if I misheard you, were out of control. You are not in control. Isn't that true that sometimes we have graces that come? Graces in the best sense of the word, where we are not in control. <laughs> it just happens. Great. Group back here. What y'all okay, come up? Talk about uh, watching a beautiful tornado form. Mm -hmm. I love tornadoes. Yeah. <laughs> this gentleman was talking about sitting watching a little baby bird that sat on his foot. And I, and I realized that I cannot adequately express to him the beauty of watching a forming tornado any more than I can experience what he did of the baby bird on his foot. Yeah. We have to put ourselves out there yep. and not be closed in. Yeah. Putting ourselves out there. Experiences that aren't our doom. Needing to put ourselves out there. Dare I say, use a little bit more of a psychological, spiritual term, being vulnerable. Putting ourselves out in vulnerability. Peeps up here, what'd you come up with? Chop, chop. <laughs> Stars, flowers, waterfowl. Mm -hmm. Long swales. For those watching online, similar themes that we've heard elsewhere. Why? Why do those things bring you closer to God? Oh Ron or Balthazar can't just be the pretty little things. Uh, yes. You've got to reflect a little bit on the whys here. Uh, the beauty that it sort of arouses passionate feelings, uh, awe and wonder, and um, 
something that I, I actually feel interiorly. Mm -hmm. So to use C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves, and I know that some of you might be like, ah, what did Father just say? There's an eros. Now, sadly, we've reduced eros to simply sex. But when you really look at eros, what is it? Those things that strike our passions. You know, um, I don't have the typical eros experience looking through my telescope. <laughs> But boy, there's something passionate in me that gets stirred. Like when, when I saw, oh, we got prominences today! And then I couldn't find them, and then thankfully Chris bailed me out with the proper hand controllers. Um, wow. Builds a passion. One important thing, when I was in seminary trying to play catch up with philosophy that I didn't learn because I was a music major, I, as many seminarians do, reduced God to Aristotle. God is the unmoved mover. So what is God then in my not-formed brain? <laughs> no emotion, no passion. Dare I say a stoic understanding of God. Who is the God of the Old Testament and New? I am a jealous God, or perhaps, in, with, depending on what Hebrew you translate, I am a passionate God. <laughs> I have my passion for you. And it's so passionate, I want you. I don't want another God to have you. That's not the... <laughs> That's a dynamic God. <laughs> That's a God that kind of hits the you know, the passion sensitivities. All right, next in the back. Chop, chop, come on. You're just like nice high school students. I don't want to talk. Come on. <laughs> we talked about um, the beauty of flowers. Uh-huh. Um, what else? Oh, the Fibonacci series. <laughs> it is amazing, isn't it? Yes. Uh -huh. I, have, I told them I have grown a beautiful, perfect sunflower, put it in my garage. Last vacation came back from my city, but it was nature. Mm -hmm. And there are times, if, if for those online who didn't hear this, I had this beautiful flower, but then the mouse, mice came in and ate it. And there are times, like with mosquitoes too, where I'm like, okay, God, I love your creation, <laughs> but really, mosquitoes, <laughs> mice. But then I started to do Sawit Owl, and I'm, oh, food source. <laughs> Owls, come over, take care of my mouse problem, <laughs> you know. Um, birds, little songbirds, come in, take all the mosquitoes you want, <laughs> you know. <laughs> God love them flycatchers. <laughs> um, but, but then connectedness in an odd way. Even the frustration of watching mice eat a beautiful flower. There is a sense of connection that's needed. Oh, oh, did you have a Yeah. What about Christian through God, to, from God to humans, mm -hmm. when humans create things? I had a bit trouble over the years. I collected things that were beautifully made by artists and craftsmen. Mm -hmm. Not trouble, but my house was full of things like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got rid of lots of them. I could downsize them. That tells me you're good Catholics because Catholics, we don't throw anything away. <laughs> There's a reason why the Vatican archives are so sought after by historians. We're just pack rats, so take it as it now granted. Do we have to declutter your house? Yes, I have to declutter my rectory, but yeah. Moderation. It can, yeah, so. In the back. <laughs> Everybody in the heart is a teenager scared to talk to a teacher. <laughs> oh, <hey. laughs> Sunflowers, pansies, oh. Polish poetry, yes. Polish poetry? Dare I say, who's our Polish poet laureate? Which Polish poet do you enjoy the most? Wisławoszymborski. Ah, I don't. Oh, he won the Nobel uh, Prize in Literature in 1996. 
or poetry is very down to earth. Mm -hmm. Nothing abstract or uh, very everyday images, but by the end of the poem, she really hits you in the middle of the heart. Mm -hmm. It really it, it lowers, it lowers the boom. You know, that I exist. Ah. Uh, that kind of thing. So not only does an encounter with the beauty of somebody's thought through poetry, not only does it bring you to God, but something hits in you that affirms your existence. That you're a part of the story. One of the, at first I thought it was kooky, but the more I become a priest, I just see it, it to be true. One of our scripture professors in seminary said, you know what, the shift that all of you need to make with your understanding of the Bible is to not just think about of it as the telling of a historical person you know, over 2,000 years ago, the events around it, but that this is about you, too. You have to make that switch. And at first I thought, nutty! <laughs> the unformed seminary in me. <laughs> but then as I engaged scripture, I'm like, dang, what did you know? The guy was right. I wonder that's, that's why they had him teach. All right, up here, and then we'll move on. Yeah, so we talked about the creation of flowers, blue bells in particular, lily pads and vines in the boundary water view area in uh, Minnesota. And these were various forms of creation, but the, the one that I think sort of stuck with me the most was what Father said his most moving thing is the creation of man in a woman. The, excuse me. The creation of man and woman. The creation of man and woman. I tell you, I hope that those of you are married, that, you know, that part of life that's always awkward for us as priests to talk about is something you cherish and treasure and enjoy. I hope otherwise. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but yeah, the, you know, we, and that's why we, in the documents, we speak of the fecundness of human life. as fruitfulness, just as a certain Jesuit, shout out to the team of George Coyne, often would speak of the fecund universe. I also mentioned mosquitoes. <laughs> if you give me a good reason why there's mosquitoes, my talk is ruined. No. <laughs> hey! Dad joke alert. Okay. <laughs> One last point, and if I, I'll say what I interpret you to share with me, but we had a quick side conversation of, was I right in presuming to summarize the beautiful reflection you had with me? But Father, there are scientists, because there's a danger in all this stuff. Father, scientists talk about how they do is beautiful too. And like equations and all that kind of stuff. It's very true. We can't think, oh, natural world, beautiful, good, science bad, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> and, you know, working on equations. And to that, I can action, and Brother Guy can give more to this if I inadequately quote him, but I remember watching one of Brother Guy's presentations on how he said that, you know, you can find in terms of things like cosmology, many equations that work. But oftentimes, what are the ones that scientists gravitate towards most? the one that's most beautiful, the one that's most elegant, that there's something about the equation that speaks to the human heart of the scientist. Well, does that mean that that's just subjectivism? No. <laughs> but there is this interaction that even within the equation, one can find beauty. Did I do a good enough job with that? Good. All right. Moving on, because Father Supe needs time. Um, this all kind of goes into one of my favorite theologians that we seldom use, but is very important. One of the last of the true East and West figures before the Great Schism, Maximus the Confessor. The entire cosmos consists of the visible and unvisible. Um, can also be said of the human person. The human person, body and soul, is a cosmos. This is way, way before science is even on the radar screen. For the intelligible things participate in the substance of the soul as the soul has the same reason 
as the intelligible ones. And the sensible things bear the image of the body as the body is the image of the sensible things. The intelligible things are the soul of the sensible ones. And the sensible things are the body of the intelligible ones. Complicated theological talk for we live in a cosmos. You are a cosmos. If you've ever seen the cool little um, display of the protein walker, I always think of like the walkers from Star Wars and that kind of stuff. Your very being is a cosmos of wonder that lives in a cosmos of wonder that through wonderment and grace, uh, through like the waters of baptism, we experience beauty. We experience God. And as scripture affirms, fear of the Lord is the beginning of holiness. Not to be afraid of God, but in awe and wonder is the starting point. That's the starting point. Then the fun begins. Experience awe and wonder. And we'll pick this theme up in my next presentation. Thank you.